I'm going to talk about um, the Quaker furniture in Guilford County, North Carolina, moving a little bit west from what June had talked about. And yesterday, um, last night, I showed everybody a map that was um, um, showing the landscape, the Quaker landscape of eastern North Carolina and southeastern Virginia in the late 18th century. If we do the same using the Henry Muzon map for Piedmont, North Carolina, locating within the square, the Wachovia tract, where the Moravians were, uh, really where we are right now, we can see that when that map was published in 1775, it was really already behind the times. It really only depicted the Cane Creek settlement on the east um, with New Garden meeting uh, um, in the middle and uh, I think probably Deep River. But in fact, if you look at the totality of Quaker meetings that existed at that time or would very shortly exist within the next couple of decades in Piedmont, North Carolina, you really get this. And it's why it was known as the Quaker Crescent, because you had such a wave of Quaker migration coming into Piedmont, North Carolina, and in the middle of all of those dots with all of those different meetings is uh, present-day Guilford County, where the large city of Greensboro is located. Now, the reason why I think that area is special is because its patterns of migration blend so many of the influences we've talked about for the last day and a half. In the, initially, it's a massive wave of migration in the 1750s, coming down from Chester County, Pennsylvania and its surrounding region and the areas that Alexandra and Lisa talked about this morning. Um, later in the 1770s, oddly enough, a second wave of migration hits from Nantucket, Massachusetts and its surrounding area as Quakers in that area that Dennis Carr had talked about move and join the Pennsylvanians in present-day Guilford County. And while there had always been a trickle of Quakers from the Tidewater joining that area, once 1780 hits and Quakers now must emancipate their slaves, former slave-owning Quakers in the Tidewater give up, give up slave-owning and increasingly move into non-slave-owning areas and move into Guilford County and eventually following that same trail that Nick Powers talked about up into Quaker settlements in Ohio and in Indiana and beyond. But within that melting pot of all of those different waves of migration emerged an amazing group of furniture with a lot of that blending of different regions as well as a lot of uh, uh, in intuitive genius and imagination um, added to it. And that's the group that we'll explore for the next few minutes. Now, I can't talk about this group without paying homage to the late John Bivens. He was really the pioneer who put Quaker furniture studies in the South on the map. He was the one who talked about Thomas White in his book on the furniture of coastal North Carolina. He was the person who identified the Quaker connection when he uh, published his article in the magazine Antiques, identifying what was then known as the Jesse Needham group that we'll re-identify and reattribute this afternoon. And so we really are here standing on his shoulders with so much of what we talk about as it relates to the contribution of Quakers to North Carolina furniture studies. And so much of what we know now wouldn't be possible were it not for Ancestry.com and its Quaker files with so many records that are now searchable uh, um, um, by name, across meetings, in a way that allows us to assemble information so quickly. And it was the use of that database that allowed me to stumble across a few interesting facts. New Garden Monthly Meeting Minutes in Guilford County on November 29th, 1777, noted that a man by the name of Thomas Pierce had moved from Center Meeting, slightly south, into New Garden Meeting and that accompanying him was David Osborne, an apprentice lad. Now that was important because 10 years later, as an adult, that apprentice lad would buy land from his father's estate and be identified as 
David Osborne cabinet maker. And in 1787, this is the first use of the term cabinet maker identifying that profession positively in any Guilford County record, eliminating any question as to what little David had learned in the household of Thomas Pierce. Now that became important because we could keep following the chain within that database and realizing that Thomas Pierce had uh, um, um, applied for a certificate to leave Bradford Monthly Meeting in Chester County, Pennsylvania on October 14th, 1774, and really just four weeks later would be recorded being received into New Garden Monthly Meeting in North Carolina. We can actually, thanks to these minutes that Nick Powers talked about, we can track his migration in real time moving from one location to the next when he applies to leave and when that certificate is received and it's no more than October 14th to November 18th in the year 1774. Now Thomas Pierce in a Chester County context and Bradford Monthly Meeting is not actually very evasive at all. His material world is still very reconstructible. In fact, his grandfather's house survives as the nucleus of the major house that's at Longwood Gardens today. That was the Pierce family homestead. And Bradford Monthly Meeting still stands with one of the most intact, original 18th century interiors, except for the coal burning stove in your foreground, as Thomas Pierce himself and his family would have experienced it before he made that migration in 1774. And it was great fun to be with Lisa Minardi and Philip Bradley just a few weeks ago exploring this very meeting house together. So suddenly we have the ability to understand how it is that a piece of Piedmont, North Carolina furniture seen on the left that we can now attribute to Thomas Pierce being made in Guilford County um, in the 1780s and 90s while he was here, why it is so virtually identical to a piece in the Winter Tour collection that is signed and dated by its Chester County cabinet maker, Samuel Morris in 1793, that's in the Winter Tour collection and was noted in the pencil inscriptions made for a woman named Lydia Harlan, H-A-R-L-A-N, who just happened to be Thomas Pierce's cousin. 300 miles apart, the same furniture form being made in both locations virtually simultaneously. How does that happen? It's a story of migration. We can now sort of reconstruct his biography and realize that Thomas Pierce was born in Bradford Township right about 1752. In 1775, he moved to Guilford County, North Carolina. He moved in 74. The very next year, he does one of the most important things he will do for what gathers us here today. He married Hepzibah Macy, who was part of that Nantucket wave of migration. And thus you have Chester County, Pennsylvania, and Nantucket, Massachusetts merging in the 1770s. By 77, he had apprenticed David Osborne, who was locally born, a family that had come down in the 1750s, and he was born locally, but working as an apprentice, learning the cabinet maker's trade. But by 1795, Pierce moved on to Wythe County, Virginia, where he died in 1800, leaving an extensive set of, uh, of estate records, including $85, a massive amount of money, uh, um, for the joiner's tools included in his estate. So the one piece of furniture that I think we can positively attribute to Thomas Pierce is this one high chest on frame that is walnut with tulip poplar, a little bit of yellow pine secondary wood, exactly as June described as the Piedmont, North Carolina norm, that came down in the Anthony family of Guilford County. And they, like his wife, Hepsmith Macy, were part of the Nantucket migration pattern. So we might ask, 
How, how did a family that moved from Nantucket, Massachusetts to Piedmont, North Carolina, come to own a Chester County, Pennsylvania look-alike high chest on frame? Isn't that counterintuitive? By what process can something like that even happen? Well, I'm grateful to Philip Bradley for sharing with me some examples of this Chester County form that he's known for decades. And we can actually see the role of the Eaches family, Robert Eaches, having made these two examples in Chester County, signed and dated, um, one in 1755 and the other in, um, what is that number? My eyes are getting so bad, 1789. Um, um, so we can see how the earlier version of the high chest on frame form is a little more elevated, and then over time, the case becomes deeper, and the frame becomes shorter and squatter, and this is the form that Thomas Pierce brings with him to uh, uh, Guilford County, North Carolina. Now, Robert Eaches' son, um, you know, his nephew, Virgil, is the person who's responsible for these two examples. And both signed, both dated uh, um, in the 1780s. And what's interesting is, again, thanks to the Quaker records that are online, we can say that Virgil Eaches actually moves into Bradford Township for his apprenticeship. Meaning, Virgil Eaches, when he's making these in the 1780s, is living in the very place that Thomas Pierce came from. And I think in all likelihood, they are both as young men coming out of the very same shop. And I think in all likelihood, they are coming out of the shop of Joel Bailey Jr., who is the son of the Joel Bailey Sr. that Lisa talked about in her lecture this morning. So if we compare these two, we can see how they both have the commonality of the uh, panel triffid foot at the very bottom. In fact, part of what distinguishes the Thomas Pierce high chest on frame is that it's the only one in the area with that triffid foot, which is why I think it's the earliest, because it's the most clearly spot on Chester County, Pennsylvania. And it also has um, the same little change that happens over time in the group, a little bit of a variation over whether that central drawer at the top is wider than the other two or whether they are equidistant. And with Virgil Eaches's work, we can see how both of those options are available. The one on the left has the wider center drawer. And that is, the, that is the form that Pierce brings with him when he moves to Guilford County. Now, his apprentice lad, David Osborne, rep represents an interesting family itself. And if we go to center meeting today, and unfortunately this is a very modern 20th century building, but with a very historic graveyard, there's actually a monument to the Osborne family noting their uh, immigrant uh, uh, ancestor, uh, Matthew Osborne, who makes the Great Migration down to North Carolina, and then noting all of the different families with whom his children intermarried. And if we look at where they were from, this early blending of the first generation within Center Meeting, the vast majority are from Chester County, Pennsylvania, Ballard, Cox, Frazier, Reynolds, but then you get the Stouts from York County, Pennsylvania. You get the Lamb family from Eastern North Carolina and the Davises from Nantucket, Massachusetts. So David Osborne, that first person to be called a professional cabinet maker in a Guilford County record, was born in Guilford County. His birth is recorded in the minutes in 1759. By 1777, he was apprenticed to Thomas Pierce from Chester County, Pennsylvania. He left that apprenticeship in 1780, married Elizabeth Thompson around 1785, continued to practice as a cabinet maker in the center meeting area 
through the 1790s, apprenticing John Stanton, who was from eastern North Carolina, also Quaker, into the shop joiner's trade. But by 1804, joined that massive wave of migration west, moving to Miami Monthly Meeting in Ohio, and eventually on to Wayne County, Indiana, a major Quaker center, and dying there in 1833. I do think when we look at all of the circumstances around his life, he is the most likely candidate to be the maker of this late 18th century Guilford County desk and bookcase. The reason being, it's been known for a long time. It was published in the magazine uh, Antiques uh, in 1941 with this photograph. The Quaker Association of it then was called out in 1941. And our records at the time of the purchase by Frank Horton note that it had been acquired by from the Lamb family in Randolph County. Those were the very same Perquimans County Quakers named on the Osborne family monument as having intermarried with the Osbournes within that first generation. This piece has the um, um, distinction of being the earliest of all of these case on frame pieces of furniture made in the, made in the Guilford County uh, area. You can see its little short uh, cabriole uh, um, uh, feet sitting on top of a scallop frame with the um, uh, two supports running back to front to hold up the full weight of the case that sits on top. But how interesting to think about the fact that if Osborne trained under Pierce, if he was born in Guilford County, but trained under somebody who had been trained and born in Chester County, Pennsylvania, how did that manifest itself? Well, let's compare the interior of this desk to the interior of that Joel Bailey senior desk and bookcase that Lisa showed and look at the arch prospect door and the configuration of all the small drawers and pigeonholes and see that there is sort of a one step removed relationship. Or let's compare it to the configuration of this Robert Eaches desk um, um, that survives from Chester County and note how they both, this is a minor detail, but we will come back to it. Note how they both share a common Pennsylvania and Southern detail of having a fallboard with mitered battens. I'm gonna ask you to remember that detail. So we can see all of these different subtle Chester County influences in the work that we think was produced by someone born here, but trained under a Chester County migrant. But clearly what is the most famous and distinctive feature of this particular piece of furniture is the, what we might be tempted to call the Chinese pagoda pediment. Now, could this have been inspired by Thomas Chippendale? Could this be five degrees of separation from <laughs> urban London to rural uh, early Guilf uh, Guilford uh, County in the 18th century? Or could it be a design concept that lingered in the local vernacular, such as when we compare that uh, um, pediment to this tombstone for uh, David Coltrane in one of the nearby cemeteries for uh, the Methodist church that sits right on the Guilford Randolph County line, following those same sweeps um, that we see on the uh, uh, desk and bookcase on frame. Regardless of where the inspiration comes from, I think what we can say is that it is probably the earliest surviving expression of what I'm just gonna call Piedmont, North Carolina Im imagination. The ability for a local cabinet maker working in a rural area to engage his own mind and his own skill for his own expressive creativity in a way that might have been true in a rural area more than in, say, a Newport or a Philadelphia where an urban style was churning along and everybody was simply trying to keep up with that, uh, uh, with the, with, with that emerging urban style, whereas a rural cabinet maker gets to kind of, to some degree, make up their own rules. 
At this point, the area that we're talking about, very much along the line of June's lecture, is focused on center meeting right on the Guilford Randolph line and sort of a 10, maybe 12 mile radius around that. And it's why so much of the furniture in this group shows up exactly within that area, predominantly among the Quaker families, especially those who were members of <clears throat> center monthly meeting. I do think very recently another piece of furniture has emerged that is probably David Osborne's product, and it is this tall case clock um, made right around 1794. I think we can actually date it very specifically. It's walnut with yellow pine. I'm uh, uh, grateful to Chris Jones for sharing this photograph, but look at the sweep of the pediment on that and the way it curls up at the ends in a way that is vaguely reminiscent of the pediment on the desk and bookcase. And we can really very, very precisely date this object. The face of the clock says at the top, made for Barzillai and Jemima Garner. And at the bottom, Jonathan Jessup Yorktown. Well, if we go to the monthly meeting minutes of New Garden, Barzillai Gardner married Jemima Macy, two Nantucket families who had migrated to Guilford County on March 2nd, 1774, or third month, as I would have said in the Quaker calendar, um, abhorring use of pagan monthly names. Their son, Barzillai Jr., transferred to York County, Pennsylvania on April 26, 1794. In 1794, little Barzillai moved to York, Pennsylvania to apprentice with Jonathan Jessup, the clockmaker, who himself was born in Guilford County. He doesn't like it so much. After two years, little Barzillai comes home, and he didn't complete his apprenticeship, although he does go on to become a very famous clockmaker. So in the end, what we have with this object is a case made by a Guilford County clockmaker for a family that had migrated from Nantucket, Massachusetts to Guilford County and had been married there, and a son who was going up to York County, Pennsylvania to complete his apprenticeship as a clockmaker for a clockmaker whose family was from Pennsylvania but had moved to Guilford County and he's now back in Pennsylvania working as a clockmaker. This object, I think more than any other, may sort of symbolize this triangulation of the three different areas between Nantucket, Guilford County, uh, uh, southeastern uh, 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 Pennsylvania, and um, Chris, am I right in thinking that this object might still be on the market? Chris? What, excuse me? Yes. Should we have an auction right here? <laughs> <laughs> but really such a powerful document and so if you want to place this object on the map if you go to the Price Struther map it actually shows exactly where the Barzillai Gardner family lived it, and they were right along Hickory Creek not very far sort of equidistant between Center and New Garden and Hickory Creek um, for what it's worth was the very creek that Thomas Pierce and David Osborne had lived on and worked on. So this was the piece, this clock, the clock face would have been made between 94 and 96, while little Barzillai is still trying to be good and trying to be a good apprentice. And then it comes down and has a local case made for it. And by that time, Pierce has gone on to Wythe County, Virginia. Um, uh, David Osborne is the, is the cabinet maker of that, of that region. But then comes the new character, Henry Macy. Henry Macy was uh, um, Hepzibah Macy's cousin who married Thomas Pierce. He was born in Nantucket, but when he was about 12 years old, his family were latecomers in the Nantucket migration. It was about 1785 that they moved to Guilford County. About 1795, he got married. They were members of Center Meeting. In 1798, he began keeping a cabinet maker's account book. 
And that was a major discovery in this research process that we had not previously known and that was not known to John Bivens when he wrote that Antiques Magazine article in the, uh, in the 1970s. But in 1808, it all begins to come together and make sense. He apprenticed Jesse Needham's brother-in-law, Frederick Fentress, who was from Eastern North Carolina, who then married his eldest daughter, Sarah Macy, uh, um, um, merging the two shops, now showing the, 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 the merger of Eastern North Carolinians with these Nantucketers, with these Chester County, Pennsylvania overlays, all happening within the Guilford County context. And in 1846, he died in Guilford County with a set of joinering tools, turning tools, and the infamous glue pot that June Lucas talked about. Now, if we go to the Mesna Craftsman database, um, the, the, the Macy's are there. Um, they're there because they're documented for their work in uh, blacksmithing as well as cabinet making. Um, when Thomas Macy is thinking about leaving, he advertises that his farm is for sale, that it's very near Center Meeting House. But the um, uh, records that Mesda had read did not document the cabinet making trade and its full depth and length and importance. And when you, in delving through those account books that stretch from 1796 to 1844, a whole new cast of characters come to life. David Osborne is there. Uh, William Needham is there. Samuel Brazelton, whom we'll hear about, is there. And Frederick Frentress, the apprentice who becomes a son-in-law, is all there. Now, the other great discovery is that pieces that had came right out of the Macy family came to light through local collecting. And I'm very grateful to Bill Ivey for sharing so much of his research and his knowledge on this particular area. Here we're looking at a chest of drawers that came right out of the Macy family and that has this um, um, OG bracket foot with its own interior profile and spur that is one of the quintessential foot forms of what was previously thought to be the Needham Group, but that we can now really pinpoint to uh, Henry Macy working in the shadow of what had preceded him from David Osborne and Thomas Pierce. The other thing is that new objects came to market since the um, um, publication of John's article including this desk and bookcase with the initials SB and the year 1812, SB, Samuel Brazelton, and this chest. Now, th this was the smoking gun. Jesse Needham, throughout almost all of his life, lived and worked in Randolph County. That becomes an important distinction because when this chest was made with um, um, straight bracket feet, but with the same interior profile as the OG bracket foot, it was extensively signed by two young men, apprentices or journeymen, who were goofing off in the shop one day and thought it would be really fun to just go crazy on this one drawer and write Samuel Brazelton, David Pickett, September 30th, 1816, and specifying that they were in Guilford County. So if they were in a cabinet shop in Guilford County, they could not be with Jesse Needham in Randolph County. And lo and behold, those are the same cast of characters, the very same names in the Henry Macy account book. Now, in John's article, one of the most important ornamental objects exhibiting these expressive pediment types was this high chest on frame that he published in the article with its reading at that time of the inscriptions that were found within it. And it included the name William Needham. And John hypothesized that this might have referred to Jesse's cousin, William Needham, who was an older man living in southern Randolph County. Luckily, this piece came on the market a few years ago. Since then, it's been made available for scholarly study. We've been able to improve the photography. And what you're looking at is the ability to put together a composite of some very difficult angles to maneuver inside that case 
to realize that it actually says William Needham's joiner work. So William Needham was not the cousin in Southern Randolph County as an owner, as speculated. This is Jesse's oldest son, William, working in the cabinet shop of Uncle Fred, Uncle Frederick Fentress, who had married Henry Macy's daughter, and they're all there in Guilford County working together, and it's why William Needham is in the Henry Macy account books. It becomes a seamless family story exactly along the lines of what June talked about earlier. Now, there was another inscription that John could not yet decipher, but with improved photography, we can now realize that it actually says Miss Anna M, and then a last name that begins with the letter O, her hand and pen. So if we look for any opportunity to explain Anna M and a last name that begins with O, the only real one that I can find is Anna Macy, Hepzibah's cousin, who marries William Osborne, David's cousin, in 1789, and they have a daughter, Anna, who was born in 1806. And I think this is probably her as a, as a very young girl scribbling on the back of a, of, of a drawer of this high chest on frame. So suddenly we can place this piece of furniture perfectly within this context of faith and family and community all within that center meeting region. And we can go back to those account books and find all of these very names, Samuel Brazelton, David Osborne, William Needham, Frederick Frentress, in unity, working together, intermarried, interrelated, worshiping together on a regular basis. Now, the Macy account books are pretty extraordinary. They go on for a long time. The earliest record is 1796. It uh, finally terminates in 1844, shortly before his death. Um, uh, he makes one bottle case recorded in there, multiple chests, bureaus, cases of drawers. You see the different price points. I think this explains when you're talking about the high chest on frame versus the lower chest of drawers, such as the one that came out of the Macy family. Multiple clock cases, particularly clock cases for a man by the name of Thomas Swain. Desks, a desk and bookcase, sideboards, cupboards, tables, the tea table, three candle stands, 52 coffins. Coffins are a big, big part of the business. Um, I don't think that the account book documents all production. I think it only documents production on account, um, uh, 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 where the account was not fully paid for and settled. I think there are things probably paid for in cash on delivery that are not in the account book. And I am going to get this written up by the end of the year, I promise, I promise. And that will explain why when you dig into the nuances of the account book, it becomes pretty clear that some things are being made, but there's uh, uh, an apprentice is being paid for work, but there's no corresponding sale for that work. And there's, there are lots of objects that are not in the account book. This is not the totality of production. But interestingly, if you tie together the provenance of some of these pieces with uh, uh, references in the account book, things do come together. This corner cupboard descended in the Jesse Davis family, and in 1799, uh, uh, Henry Macy had work, uh, work done upon thy house for six pounds. One reason why there are so many clock cases in this group is the, uh, are the Thomas Swain accounts, where over time, 11 clock cases are made. And it becomes very clear that Thomas Swain himself is in the clock making business. And if you study the account book with uh, 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 debits and credits, what Swain is often credited for is the sale back to Macy of a completed clock and at one point for watch repair. So this is the cabinet maker and the clock maker working together in tandem supplying cases for this market. Now one thing that I think is interesting is that with all of the cases in this group in a way that is distinct from the clock case that I would attribute to David Osborne, they all have these enclosed arched hoods. Now these are very different from the, hood, the clock hoods that June showed you um, and, really, and the clock hoods uh, uh, that Nick showed you that have 
very um, um, Pennsylvania-inspired scroll pediments. But interestingly, if you go to Dennis's book on Newport furniture, you'll see lots of clocks with these enclosed scrolled hoods. So I think this may well be a sign of that New England influence coming in very early and defining what the clock cases that are popular in this area look like. And then also the account books um, show that in 1808, Isaac Farlow, a major amount paid for work done on the house, 42 pounds, 16 shillings, and lo and behold, here's another uh, high chest with one of these expressive um, pediments that came down in the Isaac Farlow family. Now, the Macy's perhaps closest neighbors living right alongside, um, um, right beside them in um, near Center Meeting, were the Hockets. And one branch off of Polecat Creek was Hockets Creek. And here you see a desk and bookcase that came right out of the Hockett family. This is sort of the plain style version. The Hockets were um, essential members of Center Meeting for decades since the mid 18th century. And you can see how now the foot form has evolved. It's a straight bracket foot with a very simplified um, um, interior profile, but the removable prospect and removal prospect door that we see on many of these pieces, and then um, um, lots of red pencil marks um, uh, that, that we see defining the construction of this particular group. You can contrast that in everything but construction, but stylistically, with this desk and bookcase that has a Northern Randolph County history. And this one has all the bells and whistles. And it was illustrated in John's article, and you can compare it to the high chest on frame. But you can begin to sort of pick it apart, and let's just sort of do a little quick comparable study of how, you know, look at the, um, um, the uh, uh, solid wooden panels across the top of the bookcase. Uh, the, the, the bottom row of panels and how they are uh, solid wooden and compare that to the corner cover that was picked for the cover of John's book on coastal North Carolina furniture where these blind panels are a common eastern North Carolina concept that shows up in places like Perquimans of Pasquotank County and the shaped upper panels to the glazed doors and compare that to the same corner cupboard. So are we beginning to see these Eastern North Carolina influences through that wave of migration impacting and influencing what had previously been this dialogue between Chester County, Pennsylvania and Nantucket, Massachusetts? Well, I think we begin to see how this blending, this merging, this incubation of all these different influences is going on in uh, Southern Guilford County through the Pierce to Osborne to Macy shop tradition. If you um, um, compare these two desks, as I said before, Robert Eaches, what we can now attribute to Henry Macy, we can see how so much of their form, the foot profiles, the um, architecture of the interiors, very much speaks to Chester County influence. But I ask you to remember one important detail earlier about the Osborne desk and bookcase and the each desk that you see here, and that is how in typical fashion there, you had mitered battens on the fall board. Guess what the Macy desks and desk and bookcases have? Straight battens rather than mitered at the corners. And where is that tradition common? in Massachusetts. That's a New England, that's more, much more of a New England feature. I think the same may be true with the uh, legs and slipper feet that we see on so many of these forms. And here you can look at the silhouette that's in the Mesda collection, as well as the high chest on frame that's in the Mesda collection, and see these cabriole legs that terminate with these narrow little slipper feet Let's compare that exact form with this piece made by Gideon Hathaway in New Bedford, Massachusetts um, between 1770 and 1790. Or go a little more upscale and compare it to this piece made by Christopher 
Townsend in Newport, Rhode Island. And in fact, if you pick up Dennis's book, there is <clears throat> another piece uh, made by Christopher Townsend in Newport of a very plain style, but the same form with the same slipper feet, but that has a Nantucket provenance. It belonged to a Nantucket family. So this is really the cabriole foot form that Jemima Macy would have known at the very time she was marrying Thomas Pierce at New Garden Meeting in 1775. So if we take the map and look at that Guilford Randolph County line and focus on where Center Meeting is located just above that line, and if we think about all of the different furniture and the different furniture forms that we look at with this group, and if we chart where the cabinet making shops were within this group, within a few miles of each other, but how it evolved over time from Thomas Pierce farther up Hickory Creek to David Osborne, uh, right closer to the county line along Hickory Creek, and then moving over closer just west of the meeting with the Henry Macy shop from the late 1790s, I think into the late 1820s, and then picking up with Frederick Frentress um, through his apprenticeship, his marriage to Sarah Macy in 1815, and his ongoing career. And if we take that portion of the map, locating the cabinet shops, and look at where those furniture forms are being discovered and where the families that own them are, we really see how it forms a very tight cluster around Center Meeting and around that Pierce, Osborne, Macy, Fentress, tradition. So it helps us understand how it is that a high chest on frame like this can begin with a Chester County, Pennsylvania case with the addition of New England, Newport inspired legs and feet, but be crowned by a great piece of Piedmont, North Carolina expressionism. Or take a desk and bookcase like this and realize that at the bottom of it is a very Chester County, Pennsylvania desk. But it's topped by a bookcase with these Eastern North Carolina influences of blind panels at the bottom and arch uh, glazed panels at the top but with that same Piedmont, North Carolina, imaginative expressionism to crown the entire statement. Or we can take that cellaret that we can now attribute to Henry Macy and Guilford County and compare it to one in the Winter Tour collection that was made by Thomas White. Are they completely alike or are they completely different? To what extent did Eastern North Carolina Quakers moved to Guilford County with the concept of a bottle case being a box that sits on top of two drawers with extended cabriole legs with them. And when they engaged the local cabinet makers, it got reinterpreted and they got what they asked for. They got a box over two drawers with extended cabriole legs but it went through the mind and the memory of cabinet makers who represented different ethnic traditions. So I'll close with this image of North Carolina Yearly Meeting in 1869, when the Quaker community, after surviving the Civil War, after surviving decades of, let's admit it, oppression as pacifists and as abolitionists, was able to come together and when they came together in 1869, they at that point represented a perfectly blended community who had lived together and intermarried for a hundred years, representing all of these different migratory strains from southeastern Pennsylvania, from Nantucket, Massachusetts, and from and the Tidewater Quakers moving in to uh, moving in to join them. And so when they came together, whether it was by carriage or wagon or horse or foot, they did represent 
this unique American statement of how migration patterns could come together to produce unique furniture forms in their own American vernacular. Thank you very much.